Smuck is celebrating the 125th birthday of the Babe. Peter, reflections on the Orioles in the future and what the Babe left us as a legacy here. Well, first off, I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, I, I, I was not alive when Babe passed away or lived or died, uh, but I came close. Okay, a few years before he, he passed away, just a few years before I was born. But of, of course, the, the Babe is perhaps the greatest sports figure in Baltimore history might be, if you looked at everything impact-wise, you might be able to make the case the greatest sports figure in American history. Um, you know, we can, make a, we can make an argument for a number of other people, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's always great to be here with the Babe, Babe Ruth Museum folks uh, to celebrate the, the life of Babe Ruth and to uh, talk about the Orioles, talk about the Ravens. Uh, this, this particular event is just kind of a Baltimore thing. It doesn't have to be just about the Bay, gotcha. uh, but he does tend to fill up the room. He does. If you get my drift. All right. Well, we had a chance to uh, have a candy bar named after the Bay. Will this year be the Orioles' year to have a cookie named after him? <laughs> I know it depends on how it crumbles. Uh, uh, it's it's going to be a, a interesting year. Uh, I'm because of my role as a columnist and baseball writer. I view it differently than the fans. Fans want to see wins. They want to see stars. Uh, they want to see young players uh, emerge. Uh -huh. They're going to get to see a little of the young players emerge part, but they're not going to see a lot of wins. They're not going to see a lot of stars, mm -hmm. except the ones that come in from other teams. Uh, at the same time, I still think baseball is important. I still think, I still think fathers should take their sons to baseball games, even if the team is not good. I, I grew up in an era uh, in Southern California where the uh, California Angels mm -hmm. were terrible. Mm -hmm. They were terrible year in and year out. But going to Anaheim Stadium when I was the little poor kid from Santa Ana was just the greatest thing ever. Mm -hmm. And I can still remember, and maybe you can have a similar memory, I can still remember the first time I walked through that, that tunnel out towards the field at Anaheim Stadium on a night game. First game I ever went to was against the, it was against the Boston Red Sox. 
And I walked out there and the grass was so green and the infield was so kind of orange. It was the, the, the colors, was, it was like walking into a surreal experience. I've never forgot that moment. I think of that moment all the time. And I don't want any kid to not get to have that moment just because the Orioles were in a rebuilding period. And I'm not selling tickets for them. I'm trying to stay objective. It's going to be a difficult process. But uh, if, if, if the fans are faithful and the process works, then there will be a big reward at the end. And I'm certainly hopeful of that for the city of Baltimore, for the city of baseball fans. Well, you write about sports and you report on TV about sports. What advice do you have for young people who want to become sports writers or sports announcers? Well, we're in a real difficult uh, difficult era for the media business. I mean, right now the, the, the economy is going okay and jobs are, you know, unemployment's down, all that stuff. But the media business has been in kind of in crisis for about the last decade. So what I tell kids who want to get into the business is if you go to school, or you go to college and you go to journalism school, or you go to you take you're a communications major or a broadcast major. I encourage kids to do it all. Do not pass up any class on any aspect of the media business. Because I didn't set out when I went to college to be a sports writer. I certainly didn't set out to be a talk show host. And these things come sometimes will come to you. Uh, it might be luck, and you might excel. In my case, it was probably just luck. Uh, but these things, these things come to you, and you need to be prepared for whatever. If you're a young person, you're going to want to get a job. I would also say, I would also say, if, if you're offered a job, take it right. and, and, and make the most of it. Oh wow, man! You've given me a lot to think about here. Are you done? Maybe when I grow up, I'll be a sports writer like you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pray for you. <laughs> Okay. Hey, you know, we're preparing for the big birthday bash for the babe. So if you see people moving around, just ignore it. It's just a part of getting ready to party, y'all. All right, well, thank yes. you. Peter Smuck, yes. Baltimore Sun. Yes. I on Baltimore. We'll be right back. And welcome to Babe's birthday bash. Yeah. 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 This is a special one. It's a big one. It's a big one. It's a Nobody wants to hear you speak up. This is a special one tonight. Baby will be 125 years old. Uh, it's also a special. It's the 100th anniversary of Baby being sold from the Red Sox to the Yankees. Probably the biggest sports transaction to ever take place. It is the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. And of course, it is now the 50th anniversary of the 1970 Orioles World Series. In the beginning of the cold season that led to Super Bowl V. So, and of course, 25th anniversary of 2131. Can we really all be that old? Alright, well, listen, my name is Sean. Most of you know me as the executive director of the Baby Museum. I've got a few people arriving from college tonight who learned things out of this possible. On behalf of the staff and volunteers, we thank you for all of your hard work. Uh, I want to thank Centric Business Systems. Uh, Centric has been a sponsor of this event for many, many years. Uh, we appreciate their support. Uh, we want to thank Marsha Bryant and the Black Angus Farms Farm Store in Moncton for the Rosetta Farm package that's in tonight's silent auction. Uh, many of you know Rosetta Farms provides the hot dogs and hamburgers for our opening day party, and they are absolutely fantastic. Uh, and Rosetta has been a new partner with the museum, and we're thrilled uh, for their support. Also, I want to give a shout out to uh, Kristen Powers of the Washington, D.C. Filson Shop at Logan Circle for tonight's terrific Filson Double Bag Door Prize. We of course want to thank Union Craft Brewery and Bacchus Importers for providing the beer and wine tonight. So if you are enjoying any of the beer or wine, thank you Union Craft Brewery and thank you Bacchus Importers for that. And of course a big shout out to 105.7, our radio partner, and Clear Channel for the billboard advertising for this event. Uh, thank you to the personal graphics for all the signage. And of course, certainly not least, Let's thank Game Baltimore for hosting this event for the second year. They do a fantastic job for providing the food. Thank you, Game, for, for being a home for Bay's birthday bash. I can tell you that I think Bay would absolutely love this place um, and would love this event. So finally, um, many of you know I want to introduce our MC 
seen for tonight's event. He's been with the museum for many, many years. Uh, Mr. Mike Billings. Mike? Howdy. How are you doing? Oh my goodness. Babe Ruth, the 125 years old. And I remember the first time that we did a Babe Ruth birthday bash. It was 1995. I'm John Carrington. This is Zion Baltimore, and we have a special guest here, Mr. Steve Krilovich, a champion tennis coach and tennis player, a tennis professional. Uh, Steve, you were at Gilman, and that's a school that had some great competitions in, in wrestling. I never won a match. <laughs> great wrestlers at Gilman. Well, that's great. But to be uh, talk about your tennis uh, career with the Gilman team. Yeah, uh, Gilman team's doing pretty good, uh -huh. pretty good, you know, uh, I'm the head coach over at the school and uh, we've been fortunate enough to win six MI titles in a row, we're going for our seventh uh, in a couple weeks we start up, so we're pretty excited about the season, we have a great schedule and uh, we got a lot of boys uh, working hard and uh, looking forward to the, to the spring season. Are right, you here at the Babe Ruth Baseball Birthday Bash? And, and of course you are champion in your own right, talk about your professional career in tennis. Baseball and golf and tennis, and uh, tennis seemed to, to win out. So uh, I started playing when I was a young kid, seven years old, and uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to uh, run into uh, some great uh, local players mm -hmm. around this area that helped me out, like Harold Solomon and his family. And we traveled some, and uh, things worked out pretty well. All right, Bobby Riggs. Bobby Riggs. You play him? I never played him, but I'll tell you a quick story about Bobby Riggs. He liked to gamble a lot, <laughs> and uh, he went over to Wimbledon, and of course the English like to gamble also, and he bet uh, one year that he would win the men's singles, the men's doubles, and the mixed doubles all at the same tournament. Wow. And the odds were astronomical. They'd never even heard of Bobby Riggs, you know, over in England. It was his first year over there, and he won all three. Come on, man. All right, here you go. Stories from the professional tennis ranks. Uh, what advice do you have for up-and-coming tennis players? Well, you have to have patience. Tennis is a hard sport, and uh, you have to practice a lot because it's a high, high hand coordination uh, sport. But the main thing is have patience, and um, it takes a certain type of individual to be uh, to be a tennis player. You have to be you're out there all by yourself on the court. It's like a boxer, you know. Uh, you're a little bit of a loner, and um, I would just say, uh, don't fight yourself when you're on the court because you have to beat your opponent. So if you're fighting yourself, that's yourself, you're fighting yourself, plus your opponent, that's two against one. So you've got to work with yourself to beat your opponent. Uh, moment you said fighter, I think John McEnroe. Yeah, John is a friend of mine. Uh, I played him at the 1980 US Open up in uh, New York. At the, uh, at the tournament there, and a great player, you know, fantastic, puts a lot of pressure on you with his serve, chip came in a lot, great volleys, moved very well, he's the number one player in the world, won the US Open three years in a row, he won Wimbledon, um, you know, Hall of Fame tennis player. Are you have any closing thoughts for us? Closing thoughts, well, it's, a, it's an honor to be here at the Babe Ruth uh, 125th uh, birthday bash. Uh, I'm a big uh, baseball fan. Big Babe Ruth fan, but more important, you know, he was from Baltimore, so we have that Baltimore pride, uh, you know, and Babe is, is a hero in this town. What can I say? I will. Steve, you're one of our heroes. In the, the Hall of Fame, the Hall of Fame. You were there, you are there. Talk to us. Maryland State Athletic Hall of Fame uh, inductee this year, November uh, the 7th. I guess you, I'm not going to forget that date, 2019. Uh, Mike uh, Teixeira. I'm a baseball player, and uh, Walt Williams, uh, we had a great night, basketball player for Maryland and also played in the NBA. We had, we, had a lot of, we had a lot of people that came out that night, a lot of tennis, a lot of tennis uh, people from the community and people from out of town. We had Gilad Bloom from Israel and played on the Pro Tour. Harold Solomon was number five in the world. Um, you know, we had, we had a fun night. Uh, how could you not, of course? We had Freddie McNair, who was uh, one of the top doubles players in the world back in the day. And uh, a lot of, like I said, a lot of people from the local community. It was just a real honor to uh, be nominated and inducted into the Maryland State Athletic Hall of Fame. True honor.
Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. All right. Thank you. Sure. All right. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. We're very pleasure. proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. All right. Steve. Now, listen, uh, my job tonight is to introduce our parade of champions, something we started 26 years ago, um, back when we, we kicked off the birthday bash. Now, we've got a great lineup for you here tonight. And so, without further ado, if I can read my writing, here we go. First up, from your Baltimore Orioles. I told these guys, by the way, line up alphabetically. Let's see if they can do it. Uh, he came here in 1996, and he took over as a shortstop for Cal Ripken when Ripken moved to third. He went on to record the most consecutive errorless games of any shortstop, 110 games. Most chances by a shortstop, keep it down back there at the bar, 543. He was part of the 1997 team, Orioles team, that went on to the ALCS, lost to Cleveland. And uh, today he is a broadcaster with Masson, a member of the Orioles Hall of Fame. Let's say hello to Mike Porter. Season, uh, big birthday for you. All right. All right. Thank you, Michael. Well, we All right. Number two. Next up, a man who knows as much about Maryland basketball and football, Maryland athletics. We got a game coming up here at eight o'clock tonight. I know some of you will probably want to watch that big game against Illinois. He runs the Terrapin Times. He's a fellow who, in his spare time, when he's not being interviewed on 105.7, has been doing a wonderful promotional work for the Babe Ruth Museum. A good friend, and now he's part of us. Let's give a, a, a warm welcome to Keith Cavanaugh. Keith, come on up here, buddy. He's faking the leg injury. Not really. What do you say, Keith? Are we going to do it tonight? Um, three point spread, everyone close their ears. I think Illinois is probably going to take this. Absolutely. So we've had a negative Portic, a negative Cavanaugh. I'm a realist. <laughs> uh, hopefully, I'm including Ron tonight. Big rare game. If they can win this, take over sole place, first potential. You know, first place in the Big Ten. You know what I mean. Thank you, Keith. All right, All right buddy. Thank you for being here. All right, hey, welcome back to Eye on Baltimore. I'm John Carrington, and here's Steve Cavanaugh from the University of Maryland, Terrapins. Yay, let's talk Terrapin basketball. Big night tonight. Yeah, big night tonight. What's happening? Number nine, Terps, out at number 20, Illinois. Woo! Tonight at 8 o'clock. After a little soiree here, right. we're going to be doing a game watch in the bar here for Woo! Terp fans. Um, this will probably prove to Maryland fans, can they take the next step? Can they go to the road where they've not been very successful? Very hostile environment in Illinois. The matchups are tough. They got a lot of long range athletic bigs. Maryland's got a thin front court. Brad Underwood, their coach out there, has really turned that program around. So we'll see if Maryland can be true uh, road warriors tonight. And if they win, they take sole possession in the first place in the Big Ten. Oh, you got some really great three point shooters on that team. Yeah, they come and go. You know, Wiggins is the key. I think if he can have success from the, from the strike, they'll go deep in the tournament. Cowan's been kind of mercurial, but Jalen Smith, of course, the 6'10 big man from Mount St. Joe's, he's shooting at a 60% clip from three. So he's really stretched defenses out, opened up the middle, the passing lanes. Um, so he's kind of in beast mode right now, rim protecting, blocking shots, knocking down threes. So he's been the biggest revelation in the last two weeks. Yeah. Now our team has been in the top ten for a moment or so. Yeah, they were number three a month and a half ago. Had some untimely losses at Seton Hall and at Iowa. Now they've crawled back up to number nine, and again, win tonight, sole possession of first place in the Big Ten. Yeah. And the Big Ten is extraordinarily deep this year. Maybe only Nebraska and Northwestern, can you say right now, are not going to be in the tournament. And so they're the strongest conference top to bottom as far as how many tournament bids come March. Can I, would I dare say potential national championship team? Um, knock on wood, they have the depth the athleticism and the length. However, they tend to bog down in the half-court offense, and there's an over-reliance on the three-point shot. So if they have a cold night out, and the 
and not hitting the three. They don't have enough balance offensively to make up. So that's a big question. It's all going to depend on matchups, you know, what seed, what seed and who they draw. Um, but there's such parity in college basketball this year. There's not a lot of great offensive basketball out there, if you've seen. <laughs> you know, Penn State goes to Michigan State and knocks off Michigan State. Guys, there's just way too much one-trick pony, living and dying by the three ball. But that can happen in Maryland. They could be an early out if they don't get more balance. Okay. Let's talk ter Terrapins football. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. That's my first love. I used to play in I, At Maryland, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I actually, played I went out, I was back in the day. No, Sally Krause in the wrestling team. Okay. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, uh, but but football was one of my major sports. Uh, do, what are the prospects for football? So, Mike Loxley, second year coach, mm -hmm. just signed a top 30 class two days ago, which was pretty extraordinary given the three and nine season, right. given the calamity and tragedy of a year ago when Jordan McNair passed. Having to win back the local community, the trust, having four different coaches in five years. So there's a lot of culture change going on out there. So Maryland, all things being equal, <clears throat> did a tremendous job recruiting. They signed eight junior college offense or defensive linemen. So you got some seasoned beef because we know in the Big Ten, and particularly the Big Ten East, it all happens in the trenches. <clears throat> they got two really quality four-star running backs. Um, they got a couple linebackers, particularly one from Florida, Ruben Hippolyte, who got an Alabama offer down the stretch, but still stuck with Maryland, where he committed a year ago. They're still looking for that elusive trigger man. They'll probably sign a portal grad transfer quarterback this spring. Um, so a very successful signing period, all things considered. All right, and we're talking Terrapin Sports. You're going to be on the panel today. I will be. All right, what are you going to talk about on the panel? Hi, what we just talked about. <laughs> uh, so we had a preview, folks. Yes, yes. <laughs> My prediction, tonight's game will probably be in the high 70s, a little more tempo than recently. Mind you, Maryland only had 20 points the other night in the first half against Rutgers. We can't see that again. I'm thinking 79, 76. Illinois is a three-point favorite. It's out there. It's a tough place to play. The optics and the depth perception in that gym. <clears throat> it's going to be. It's Maryland's got to play the perfect game. Tonight. All right. Well, Keith Cavanaugh, thank you for stopping by. Hey, John, pleasure meeting you. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back with more by on Baltimore. Thank you. So now Peter's going to be talking 
about the Ravens uh, a little bit later on. And um, you, you, what, do you, what do you have to think? What happened there at the very end? Are you okay? you think they're going to come back next year? Uh, I think they're going to be very good next year. I don't know where they go, where they go farther because the playoffs are a toss-up. By the way, I just want to mention something. Do we have any smut come in here? Uh, <laughs> all right, now listen. If you want your photo off, if you guys and girls could all kind of coagulate up here, uh, we'll get our photographs. So, we'll coordinate this. Come on, man. Make two men, make like you're a, 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 a team photo. All right, there you go. Get your shots. And how about a nice round of applause for all of our VIPs this evening. Welcome back to Eye on Baltimore, and I have my eye on this showcase here, and Peter Smuck is going to explain what's in the showcase. And what is in this uh, beautiful box, showcase box, is uh, Hall of Fame manager Earl Weaver's only World Series uh, ring. Oh. Won the World Series in 1970. That's the famous series where Brooks Robinson made all those crazy plays. Uh, and Earl, uh, this is the 50th anniversary of that 19. Uh, 70 World Series victory by the Orioles. Uh, they've had a few since. They've had a couple since, but uh, that's uh, uh, that's a really, really special time in Orioles history. And it's one of the great things about the Brit Babe Ruth Museum, and it used to be the Legends Museum, um, is the ability to see these things, these artifacts. And they have a collection of, of Baltimore artifacts that are featured at the Babe Ruth Birthplace uh, Museum. Uh, and, and they will be featured uh, down the line uh, at, at a, a bigger facility, I'm, I'm pretty confident. Uh, but it's, it's, it's amazing if you ever get the chance to go down in the base, basement at the Babe Ruth birthplace and see what they have down there. They bring a few things up, you know, just like the Smithsonian, you know, they bring things out and put them back. Right. Uh, but uh, you, you, you can go down there and see the, or hold the bat yeah. that Babe Ruth hit all one of those home runs with. And the amazing thing is it'll be just, it's really heavy. Like today, those guys play yeah. with these bats that are a lot this big around. Those bat, the bat he played with was huge. Oh, my. And so that's, that's the beginning of this story as far as Baltimore baseball is concerned, really. I mean, there, is, there are some great players. We really key or came before that. Uh, but this kind of encapsulates, like, the golden era of the Orioles because they had eight st 18 straight winning seasons. Mm. Uh, going back to the mid 1960s, right through the 1983 uh, World Series championship. Uh, 65 was a, a World Championship. No, 66, 66 was their first World 66. Championship, but they had a pretty good team in 65 before Frank Robinson arrived. Right, he put them over the top. They had a winning season the year before and did not have a losing season again until, I want to say, 1984. Uh -huh. Sandy Koufax played in one of those series, I believe. Sandy Koufax played against the, 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 the uh, Orioles in the 1966 series. I was a little 10-year-old in, in <laughs> Los Angeles at that time, uh, and I didn't know who to root for because I was a San Francisco Giants fan, and that was a real angry rivalry. So it's hard to root for the Dodgers, and I didn't really know that much about the Orioles. But uh, I can tell you something, and you know, it's been an unbelievable privilege for me because I have gotten to grow up. I, I actually stood in the parking lot at 10 years old and got Brooks Robinson's autograph in the parking lot at the Big A and to be able to grow up and get to know Brooks Robinson, to work with him at some point because he was a, you know, did media with the, uh, with the Orioles. It's an unbelievable honor for me. I had the, the you know, the, the great honor of really getting to know Frank Robinson also and Boog Powell and Jim Palmer and all these great Hall of Famers. So now I can't help but be an Oriole fan. So in retrospect, I rooted for the Orioles in 1966. <laughs> Thank you, Peter Smuck, for giving us all that good history. And we really appreciate you, sir. And keep on doing the good writing for the Sun Paper. And keep us all informed. Hey, I on Baltimore. We'll be right back.